So I have two bullet journals in front of me because I switched them over this month, but I'm going to give you some wrap ups on what I read in April and May because I'm behind on so many things, including a lot of wrap ups. So we're going to talk about some books real quick and uh, we're just going to go off this. So I hope you enjoy. Tell me which books you've been having fun reading. I am feeling more back in the reading spirit after struggling a lot with some things in my life. So uh, we're going to jump right in. The first one is Heartstopper and this was glorious. We all know we love the show. I watched it twice already and it made me really happy and this is the fourth volume that we waited at the library for so long and it's just about two boys falling in love and their stories and their experiences and this one deals a lot actually with um, anorexia and I really really love the way that it represented that. So often anorexia just isn't represented well. It's just one of my pet peeves because I've struggled with it for a really long time and it's always seen as a thing that's just about food or appearance, which it can be, but it's also a lot about control and about when you feel really uncertain or scared or things like that. It's it's something you can control. And also I really like the fact that we look at Nick and how it deals with the fact that he can't love someone better. And I think that especially as teenagers, like that's such an important thing to hear. So it made me really happy to read. And then I read 12 Angry Men, which is a play. And I just really, really adored this. I had watched the movie in high school and I enjoyed it. But reading the book, it's just, I don't, I really love listening to plays on audios. It's just like one of my favorite things. I think that like going forward, that's just something I'm going to focus on more because every time I do it, it makes me really happy. And this just looks at 12 men who 11 of them believe this man is guilty or are peer pressured into it. We actually never get to know the ancestry of the guy who is convicted, but we know he's like 18, 19, he's a young kid and he's accused of killing his father. And all of these people have bias against it. And we have this one man who, you know, talks about the fact that, you know, can you smell the gutter still on me and stuff. And he's feeling peer pressured. And you have a guy who has a really tumultuous relationship with his son. You have people that are kind of exploring bigotry and things like that. And I, I really, really enjoy it as a thing. I think that it goes a lot into the ways we communicate, the ways that we feel pressured. And it's just a lovely book that I'm really glad I read. And then we have notes on grief. I, I kind of regret about reading this. I know the author is very problematic. And at the time I was dealing with my grandfather's death and I, I just needed something to kind of, that was simple, that looked at death. And this was simple and it looked at death, but it didn't necessarily like help very much. It, we should all be feminists. It's a book that I felt very aligned to. And I, I felt like it, ta it talked about my experience really well. And this book did, but it, it did in some ways. There were some correlations to my own experience but I didn't really feel the catharticness of a story told. So probably just shouldn't have read it. And then we have Pride and Prejudice. I reread this again. I needed a comfort read and I really loved it. I read it on audio and it was delightful and glorious. And I listened to podcasts about Jane Austen and it was just lovely. And then we had The Souls of Black Folks. And I read this over a period, I think from February until late April. And it is really good. It has a lot to say about the experience of being Black in America. It's It came out in 1903 and deals with Reconstruction. And it's such an interesting era before kind of things and Jim Crow is being really pushed against. And it's talking about where we are and where we're coming and all of those. And it does have some problematicness. Like he does kind of blame some, especially Southern farmers and stuff for their own idiocracy and kind of looks at you know the talented 10 that we need to upraise these people who are like super diligent and amazing rather than trying to like raise everyone. And I think that there would be a more nuanced discussion around some of those things. But overall, I think that it's a really good, important part of like anti-racist history and stuff like that. And a good literature thing to remember from a historical point of view. And then my last book for April was Harris. And I I wanted to like this more than I did. It is about Anne de Bourgh and she is the daughter of Lady de Bourgh in Pride and Prejudice. And I really hoped that I would love it because it's a queer story of her and she's coming of age and finding herself and in the book that she's just kind of this super person that never really moves, never really speaks and is too weak for everything. And the author supposes that this happened because of the fact that a lot of people gave opium to children and then they become dependent on it in their entire life. And that was interesting. And I just, it is very lyrical, like it's descriptive to the nines, which can be beautiful. And I actually really enjoyed kind of the beginning, but then when she breaks free partway through and goes to town and stuff, I just found it so boring. And she's such a passive character that it's hard to sometimes get into her head and feel the emotions that she's feeling. Like I did enjoy it in parts, but overall I ended up giving it two and a half stars just because it's not a book that I'm gonna remember. It's not a book that really stayed with me. And I, I wanted to like it better. And 
I wanted to feel greater things about this story. And then as we moved to May, I, I had a delightful May in regards to reading. I had, I did not read a lot, I really enjoyed the books that I read, I really enjoyed the stories, and I started off with the Regency again with Mad Bad and Terrible to Know, the real heroines of the Regency. And this was delightful. I love books that look at different women, look at different people, and kind of do short biographies and histories. I love it from Ashley Harrison to people who, women who write, and many of the books that I've read, and I really liked this. And this, I forget her name, but she owns a like all romance book in the United States and she's like really good for like promoting that and feminism and stuff and I really loved it. It went through many women that I knew and many women I didn't and kind of just looked at England and looked at the ways that we have interpreted the most famous people and then also looking at the people that kind of get smushed under and not talked about because they're queer or they're black or they're indigenous or just not of a class that we would see and I really really enjoyed looking at these experiences and it made me so happy. So then I went on to Phantom Pains and during this time I also kind of read a lot of The Sound of the Wild Snail Eating. I haven't actually finished that book but both of these I kind of read in the time when I was getting to the hospital and thinking about diagnosis and having a lot of pain and it was really really comforting to read Phantom Pains. I, I think I want to do a dedicated video about it at some time but I read some of the things because her, her poetry is just so strong and so powerful. Like I, I adore the way that she tells stories and uses kind of the Saiyan mythology to integrate it with her own and talks about like, you know, Aswans who can take their potty apart, but they can put them back together and she can't. So she had a rare disease that kind of hit her and she ended up having to amputate her legs, part of her fingers and her reproductive organs and how much that kind of affected her life. and. I related so strongly to it. I, I'm not an amputee and don't have the same experiences, but just having health torn away from you in a moment is so relatable. And I, I was really inspired by just the, the bluntness, the beauty, and like kind of just having your own experience reflected in a different way back to you is just glorious. And then May overall was Asian Heritage Month. I did want to read more Asian books than I ended up reading, but Phantom Pains was by an Asian author and so is American Born Chinese. And this is a book that I like really liked in some points, but was also like, there, there's a character who, I can't really spoil it, but he, he represents a lot of really racist stereotypes and some of that's just kind of painful to read. But overall, it's these three interacting characters where we have um, this white boy who has this really annoying cousin who's super racist stereotypes and then we have this young boy who's you know making friends and going to school and he is experiencing the experience of being like the one Asian in his class and then you also have these stories of the monkey king and he is one of the things that I think has been exported from China the most we all know who the monkey king is and he's going through these things and he's learning all of these things about kung fu and I really especially liked his story and how it explored what it means for identity like he kind of receives discrimination for being a monkey and the heavenly heavenly people don't really love him and I loved the way that that explored his life and how he kind of wanted to use his powers to morph himself into looking like a person and the way that that's explored I I struggled in some areas but I really really love the story and I think that it's an excellent thing for teaching an excellent thing for just learning it's a middle grade book and I love books that are inventive and fun and meld different genres and are also can teach really powerful lessons and I really liked that. And following that I read Sea of Tranquility. This is a book that I want to revisit in the future because I really like Emily St. John Mandel's books and this is a book that takes place partly in the past, partly in the kind of present, and then 3,000 years from now on the moon. And these stories are interconnected and there's lots of different aspects of like time travel and science and like colonialism and the ways that life works and pandemics and it has some of the characters that are in the glass hotel and in station 11 and i love the interconnected world where it doesn't you don't need to require they're not direct sequels although this one is definitely much more related like glass castle and station 11 kind of have like mirrors in some moments where you pick up but these ones like there's characters that were main characters in the glass castle that are also main characters here but i like the body of like mythology and connective universe between them so that makes me really happy but yeah, I really, really enjoyed these stories and I really enjoyed the ways they interconnected. But overall, I didn't get the wow factor. Like the glass castle made me so emotional and I felt so connected to these characters. But because it's so short and so fragmented, I didn't feel the power. So I'm wondering if it's not a good book or I read this kind of shortly after my accident. So I think that I could have also just been 
a little bit and too much pain to enjoy it. And then I read Persuasion and <laughs> this was the most excellent choice ever because I've been listening to the podcast that talked about how, you know, one of the characters in here has a head injury and someone had like recommended it based on books to read on a head injury. And then I was like, ah, I have a concussion or a broken rib. What am I going to do? Read Persuasion. And I read Persuasion and I really loved it. This was my third time reading it. I think it makes me my most read Jane Austen book, which makes me very happy. And I, I really love Anne Elliot. I love how much of a strong, quiet character is. I'm kind of deeply afraid of the movie that is going to make her into like a sassy, spunky girl who's just like, you know, like every other girl, but not like every other girl. And that really disappoints me because I find her internal world so beautiful. And I think like the idea of speaking directly to the camera could really work because she's such a reflective character, but not in like a sassy, spunky way, you know? So I'm, I'm worried. I'm worried, but I really love this book. And I'm just excited for Jane Austen to lie. It's going to be excellent. And then we also have Silly Novels by Lady Novelists by George Eliot. So before George Eliot was George Eliot, she was Marianne Evans, and she was a accomplished reviewer, and in her 40s she had lived a scandalous life already, and she decided that she was going to outline what women did wrong in writing before she thus became a woman writer. And this was published a year before her first novel, and I, I actually don't know if it's feminist or not feminist. It's a hard book to know because in one way she's like asking for more things and in other things she's slashing women. And it, it it's one of those things like definitely a gray area. It's hard to know also how much she's being sarcastic because it's so sassy and funny. Like, you know, like she talks about like, you know, the three-year-old reading Latin and stuff. But then she also has like moments where like she's trying to uplift women. So it's it's hilarious in it's just great writing and it makes me want to read George Eliot although her, her books are a little bit much sometimes but I've still never read her. I really enjoyed the writing and the style and it did peter off a little bit more closer to the end and I had read the first I don't know 20 pages or so kind of two years ago during 2020 so it was enjoyable to reread it and to enjoy it again and just lovely. And then I feel like the month into the mostly just like random short books or things you can read in parts and this book was just delightful and this is the New York Times book reviews 125 years of reviews and I adored this. So it begins in 1896 and we started off with all these book reviews and stuff and we had we go over the history of like sometimes New York Times had book reviews before but not often and then we go through the different eras and they read dramatic ones of like really well known like the red badge of courage or the age of innocence or we get to the great gatsby and then we get to like the color purple and like we kind of go through the catcher on the rye we have interviews with jd salander we have like all of these things kirk vonnegut is interviewed there and it's such an interesting like plethora and resource of beautiful interviews and history and then there's some that are just so sassy there's some books that are like you've never heard of before that you're like okay this is just being reviewed and kind of going over what is most common during those eras there's like a saving review of Mein Kampf which is hilarious which is just like I think it said something about like nothing has been done for like the compassion for Nazis more than reading this book <laughs> it's like just being like uh everyone should have less compassion for anyone who would believe this because this book is so bad <laughs> and and it goes all the way into the 2000s we look a little bit more at like the inclusion of queer and people of color and I, I would have originally to be like slightly more um cynical in some areas but it is being produced by the people who they are self-critical because they realize they have to be self-critical but they're not gonna be too self-critical because they're writing a book about themselves so we have like brown girl dreaming and we have a bunch of the books from like the 2010s and then we get all the way to 2021 and i i really loved looking at this collection of books and it made me so happy and I think it's actually just like a tabletop book but I read it on audiobook and it was perfect. And then we have another really short book and this is an Indigenous City edit, edit and I originally just thought this by was by Wabasan Rice who writes The Moon on the Crested Snow and I was like oh he has another book that's really exciting it's a short story but he is only one of the many contributors to this and he just kind of tells a story about his life and it's it's some of them are fantasy and fiction but some of them are also just kind of memoir and experiences and stuff and we have these things where we have these characters telling their story about being indigenous in Toronto specifically which is about half an hour to an hour and a half depending on which part of Toronto you're going away from I'm technically kind of in the greater Toronto area if you ask my insurance I have to pay more insurance because I live in the area but I, I really really enjoyed the ways that it just tells different stories it tells different like futurism and like calls of action and hope and despair and just tells you stories of being in Toronto and being indigenous and I really really loved it and it's short and really well done 
And then last and certainly not least, I read Stealing Home, which is a graphic novel about the experience of being Japanese in the World War II and living in Canada and internment and stuff. And we follow like a 10 to 12 year old, I'm not exactly sure how old he is, and he talks about the Asegi, I think is how it's pronounced. I should have actually checked because I've just been reading in my head, but I think it's A-S-A-S-H-I. I might be missing that up. I'm dyslexic, but pretty much this is an all Japanese baseball team that like kept on winning and was really well loved. And they, they won by like, I think running the basis. I don't know exactly how it is, but like they would somehow make better teams by like deking them out and stuff. That's a soccer term. I played soccer, not baseball. But anyways, it's like this sign of hope and stuff like that. And they lose in 1939. And it's kind of like a sign of the end that they're like, this is weird that this is happening and stuff. And I really, really enjoyed this story. It's not actually written by a Japanese author. It's written by a Filipino author, but it's telling adjacent stories, I guess. Um, but there's a lot of research and a lot of biographies and stuff in the background. And I just really, really enjoyed reading the story. I, I was sometimes frustrated by some aspects that we kind of skipped over some of the more gruesome things of the internment. Like it does focus on how baseball and stuff brought them together and how they're looking for community and family and how his father who's a doctor is being pulled away from him. But I also kind of wish there had been more on the, the horrors of it and reconciling that Canada did this. But I also understand that, that it's a kid's book and they're not necessarily going for that. But like it's hard because I think that you should teach kids hard issues. And if you're only kind of telling this kind of empowering story about how people came together in months of mercy without actually going into the, the huge horrors and racism going on, that can be really problematic. But also I think that it is important to show the humanity and that even when people were going through terrible things, and it definitely addresses that, that does not keep, people are not only their pain, they're also their humanity and their joys of baseball and of life and of family. And yeah, I really loved it. And I hope you'll love it too and love these books. Let me know if you read any of these books, if you want to read any of these books, and I will see you next time. Happy reading, writing, and bye! But yeah, I really, really enjoyed the characters and what am I saying?